Mr. Chairman, I'm going to start with you because the big story of this legislature was the public education uh, legislation, HB3, the school finance reform fix. Every session, I've been at the Capitol coming in January, we're going to fix school finance. Every May, we didn't fix school finance. This time, we're on the road to fixing school finance. We don't want to oversell this, but we're on the road. What was the difference maker, Mr. Chairman, this time? You know, I, I would say that two, two things that are, that are important. You know, uh, the prior legislative session, um, you know, we kind of crash landed, uh, and the, you know, from, from this perspective. And, you know, at the time, Carol, you were in the House. So, you know, we tried to pass HB 21. The Senate wouldn't agree with us. We got some bill that came back that didn't look anything like what we, what we did. But it wasn't, it wasn't fixing education. So when we spent the interim uh, on the School Finance Commission, which I was completely opposed to originally. I was like, you know, we don't need to study this anymore. We just need to fix it. But we learned a lot. And it was a bipartisan group. It was a bipartisan commission. And, and the one thing that I think that made a difference was is that what we accomplished in that commission and then ultimately what we put on paper and what we passed yep. was, was transformative in the country because we're putting the money where it belongs the most into the classrooms to where the kids that need it the most and, and that was a difference. And I think that from, from my perspective, at least from the House's perspective, originally when it went out of the House, uh, we only had one no vote and then ultimately it passed unanimously. Uh, you can guess who that person was. But uh, what was interesting about it though is that every, every state representative that was involved in the process recognized, and I think Representative Wally knows this because you know, we share all Dean together, um, they were getting a lot more money than an Umble or someplace like that, but that's right. okay. That's okay. And so, so we recognize that, you know, if we're, if we're educating the children that need it the most, then we're all going to be successful. And I think that was, the, that was the ability for us to be able to get that done. Re Representative Davis, you've been on appropriations for a while. You know how difficult it is to get this legislature or any legislature to spend a lot of money on anything. This is $11.6 billion divided between an infusion of money into public education directly and a buy down of property taxes locally that allows the state's share of funding to go up. So to say that we're putting 11.6 billion into public education is true but not accurate. It's kind of a little bit more complicated than that. But still, that's an enormous amount of money. Well, it, it is an enormous amount of money. There's it, it also a couple, several billion dollars for teacher pay raises. Correct. So it was a, a total of 11.6 billion and I think 5 billion of that was for uh, property tax relief. But again, you can't have a discussion about school finance without talking about property taxes. So um, that, you know, that's, that's money that the state's putting in that the locals don't have to, have to uh, put in. But it was, it was you're know, coming into the session, it was very clear that that was, you know, public education finance reform was the number one goal of Speaker Bonin. And you know, we all, he prioritized it. I mean, it was on our cups in the member's lounge that the time is now for school finance reform. And so, um, you know, we all knew that we were going to get serious and start to deal with real um, bread and butter issues as opposed to what had right. been going on in previous sessions. Right, but Representative, you, you know that the des desire to fix public education often T-bones into the political realities of any session. And the fact is, it was liberals who supported this. It was moderate Democrats, moderate Republicans to the degree that anybody in the legislature is a moderate anymore. And, and it was hi. the most, well, hi, hi, how are you? Right there, there you go, hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I think most interestingly, conservative Republicans, 11 of 12 of the most conservative Republicans opposed HB 21 in the 2017 session, as Chairman Hubity remembers, and 11 of the 12 most conservative Republicans this time supported this bill. So there was unanimity across ideological lines. That has to also have been a big difference maker. Um, yes, and also we had money, right? And I mean, having money we, helps. Had, we went into this session with right. a very good um, budget outlook. And additionally, elections have consequences. And Republicans right. lost 12 seats in the House. And so there had to have been some soul searching about you know, why are, why are we losing those seats? Right. Um, and so I think multiple reasons, but those, those elections uh, in particular had, had to have mattered in determining where the priorities of the House right. were going to fall. S Senator Alvarado, let's take that point, and then I want to ask Chairman Wally about the availability of money. Let's do politics first. So 
the assumption all along, the oldest cliche in the world, is that elections have consequences. And this was a case in which, because the elections last time were different than in previous sessions, members returned to the Capitol in January thinking they had been told, do your jobs, keep sharp objects off the table, and make education your main priority. I think that's right. And let me just say something first. If anybody out there might be confused, Sarah is the one with the blonde hair up here on this panel. Okay, thank you. She's changed her profile. In case anybody's <laughs> listening at home on the radio, right. Okay, uh, good. But, yeah. but Evan, you're right. And, and as Sarah said, elections have consequences. And the elections of 2018 spoke loud and clear. And that's why you saw Dems pick up 12 seats in the House and two in the Senate. And I think when we go back next session, I mean, it, it doesn't take a certified uh, plumber to tell you where the leaks are. And I think we're going to pick up possibly some more seats in, in our area here and also possibly in the Dallas Metroplex area. But I think people were tired of dealing with bathrooms and anti-immigrant bashing. And this session, whether it was property taxes, Harvey, or education reform, wherever you stood, wherever we all stood on these issues, these are kitchen table issues that matter and impact Texans' lives every day. Yeah. Representative Wally, it's hard, just on that point, it's hard to imagine the legislature avoiding the temptation to move into issues that divide parties and divide people. Because we've seen over the last couple sessions, it's not just this legislature, it's any legislature loves a sharp object on the table. But you know, mostly those sharp objects were not there this session, right? Well, that, that, that's correct. And first, I want to thank you, Evan, for the invite to participate uh, on this program. And welcome to Houston, the most diverse city in the nation. Um, and yes, you can clap for that. Um, in addition to that, uh, I think it's, it's a great day that we do it uh, on a day uh, on, on June 19th that commemorates uh, the two-year delay uh, of emancipation, which is June, Juneteenth, uh, that uh, I think it's an important day to commemorate today is, is to recognize our history in Texas, but in the United States. So today is, is, is an important day for oh. So those sharp objects were taken off the table very, very early in session, not even early in session, they were taken off uh, at the ballot box. Uh, because as was mentioned earlier uh, by the panelists, uh, these elections do have consequences, but at the end of the day, uh, what you had coming in, which you had a speaker with his, uh, Speaker Bonham with his one minute, 30 second uh, press conference when he declared victory, uh, one of the first things he said was that uh, school finance will be the number one issue. I think that set the tone for the, re for the rest of the session, Chairman Huberty, yep. uh, Chairwoman Davis, uh, Senator Alvarado, that, that we were gonna get it done uh, uh, at any cost because those elections did matter. Those teachers that protested at a national level, because it wasn't just here in Texas, it was teachers and educators across the country yeah. that were clamoring for change, uh, clamoring for those kitchen table issues that Senator Alvarado talked about, that we need to get back to that, bathrooms, other issues that, that, uh, that distract from everyday Texans being able to put food on the table, to educate their kids, to live in a safe neighborhood. Those are the things that matter, uh, and in, in Houston, um, helping our congestion. Uh, and so uh, those are the things I think most people, even if you're a Democrat or a Republican across right. this state, rural or urban, you wanted uh, those issues to be at front and center. I think that first statement by the speaker that school financiers being number one, I think yep. that set the tone for the rest of the Ch session. Chairman Huber, the elections have consequences, but also leadership has consequences. The fact is you had the first open speakers race in 25 years. And had the outcome of that speaker's race been different, the tone of the session and the agenda might have been different. But because Dennis Bonin was the speaker, you were all able to same on, stay on the same script. Oh, uh, agreed. And, you know, I've, 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 I've spent a lot of time with uh, Speaker Bonin over the years and, you know, gotten to know him. And, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons he became successful is that um, he's a guy that, you know, is, is going to get in the foxhole with you and he's willing to fight. And he doesn't care about what that political outcome will be for him on a personal on a personal level, uh, but he's been around a long time. I mean, he's 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 able to survive that. And I think he did. I think uh, Representative Wally said it right. 
you know, setting the tone to what we wanted to accomplish. But more importantly, I think, is that he let us do our jobs. And that's, that's a really important thing for people to understand is that when you're negotiating um, and, and trying to get something done and we come up with the ideas, uh, that's important. But then I think uh, for those that were involved, and, you know, Representative Wally knows this, is that, you know, we, we went, I did at least, I went across the state where everybody invited us to talk to them about what we're doing and being inclusive so that the superintendents and the school districts and the school boards bought into what we were doing as well. Right. Meaning we weren't just driving something down their throats. We were actually letting them be part of that process. And, and I think that that made a huge difference. And then he just happened to be the right guy and the right job at the right time. Uh, but to, to let us do our jobs. And, you know, he was very high level with me. Um, but when it got a little sketchy at the end, you know, we, we called him in. And, you know, I said, you know, you've got two choices. You can deal with me or you can deal with Dennis. I said, I think you're going to probably prefer dealing with me dealing than with dealing then, with Dennis. Then, then deal with the speaker. Uh, Senator Alvarado, there are many things about this bill, this legislation that will affect the lives of people in the state. But the main components are an increase in teacher pay, an increase in the allotment per student, and all of a sudden, after years of people saying that pre-K was godless socialism, kids being ripped from the arms of their parents, all of a sudden everybody likes pre-K, right? That's right. And think about where we were just even last session. Chairman Huberty referenced HB 21. When it came back from the Senate, I wasn't in the Senate, but they had a, a voucher bill on there. So we've gone from people opposing all free all-day pre-K and vouchers to now every child, every four-year-old who qualifies can get all day free pre-K. And, and not only that, but as you mentioned, we've increased the per capita spending to $6,160. That's a 20% increase. And we're increasing the state's share from 38% to 45%. So that is where you're gonna see the real property reduction. So thank you, Chairman Huberty. Right, right. You know, uh, Representative Davis, this is where the cynicism about a bill like this kicks in. I mean, the fact is we don't yet know where the rubber meets the road. Already we've seen news reports that in San Antonio and in Houston, among other places, the school districts are planning to give significant pay increases to teachers. So that's actually on point, right? But Representative Davis, part of this is that it's, as you said, it's a two-tier deal. You got to reduce property taxes to drive up the, sh the state's share of public education. Are we going to feel the property tax increase that is baked into this plan? None of you was in the legislature in 2006. The last time there was a significant tax swap that was supposed to result in a reduction in property taxes, and most people back then didn't feel that property tax reduction. Are we gonna feel it this time? Well, I'm full of cynicism, so I'm glad that you asked me that particular <laughs> okay. question. Bring your cynicism, um, please. If I had to predict, I would say probably not. Um, probably it's, not. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a total of a five billion dollars um, property tax. It's compression of a, of the rate. Uh, I think you will feel a small property tax in a uh, decrease, but I think what the big driver in terms of property tax reform was really the caps um, that were put on the local. Um, the local governments, because that those right. caps stop the property taxes increase from, they they stop the, the increases from going too high too fast. Right. So the shorthand of that is that back to the days when double digit inflation was a fact of life in this country, a threshold was set that year over year property tax revenues could not go up by more than eight percent, without voters having the opportunity to collect signatures and put that increase on the ballot. This legislation reduces that threshold with some nuances. To 3.5 percent and 2.5 for school districts. 2.5 for school 50 districts. 50 percent, at least, if you're right. in Houston and you're got HISD, more than 50 percent of your tax bill is school HISD. Taxes. Right, and voters no longer have to collect signatures. It's an automatic trigger, right? And there's various transparency measures right. within the bill, so you understand more and how to protest and 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 make right. things a little more clear. But right. I think that's where you're the 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 more effective. Uh, part of property tax reform. I think what we, we did in terms of compressing the rate, you're going to see some, but I don't think it's yep. as significant 
And I don't think that anybody was ever claiming that that was going to be some, you know, significant property. Well, although, you know, Representative Wally, I'm always conscious of elites talking to elites. There are people not in the room with us today for whom $200 or $250 a year in tax relief is meaningful, right? We don't want to dismiss the impact of this tax relief out of hand. Well, absolutely not. But that's not what's going to happen in this in this with HB2 and a combination of HB3, right. you're going to see, because right now the, the burden all, is on local homeowners. Right. Um, and, and the folks in my district, which is a very low income property, uh, I would say property um, poor district uh, when it compares to other districts, my folks, $250 is a lot of money. Yeah. But that's not what they're going to see in this particular bill. So I think that's, that's um, one of the flaws, I think, in the um, in, in passing HB2 was that um, it was going to be an end-all, be-all to be able to drive down your yeah. local property tax, but that's not what's going to happen in the current, right. as, as it, in the current form. Right. Yeah, Senator Alvarado, the fact is people will go home after this session and go into primaries and tell people when they knock on doors, I cut your property taxes, and that will be a lie as far as it goes, well, will it not? and SB2... It, it hinders local government. I mean, we're sitting here in the city of Houston, which has been living under a 4.5% cap for the most part. It can hurt law enforcement. We still have the same number of police officers, about 5,200 and some change, than we had in the 1990s. We're the fourth largest city. Chicago, which we may surpass soon, they have about 13,000 police officers. So we've seen what cities who live under a cap, what can happen. And the 3.5% is going to be even more draconian of, um, of a threshold for cities like yeah. Houston. Ch Chairman Huberty, you saw a parade of local elected officials over the course of the session. Not just communists like my mayor in Austin, Steve Adler. <laughs> But, you know, uh, Steve's a nice guy. He's not he is a nice necessarily guy. a communist. But, Socialist, but, but, but former, former Republican state legislator D. Margo, now the nonpartisan mayor of El Paso, came in and said, as the mayor of El Paso, I view this as not a good thing for the city of El Paso. Right. The local elected officials echo what Senator Alvarado say. You are hamstringing our ability to generate the revenue we need to provide basic city services. Were you sympathetic to that? Well, you know, uh, as a you know, I, I, as a former school board member, I've been on on both sides of that. And and remember, what we did was we said to the school to, to the to communities, if you want to get more money, then you have to go to your voters and ask for it. Yeah. Uh, and so I've been on that other side. And my former superintendent, Dr. Sconzo, is here. We went through what three elections, right, guy? You know, t uh, two two TREs and and a bond election. And if you're able to communicate and educate your voters as to why you need to spend the money they will support it. Now, it's a little bit more difficult to be able to do that, but yep. at some point, you got to put the brakes on where the spending's at. And Representative Chairman Wall and I were just actually kibitzing amongst ourselves here and say the real problem is, is the appraisal districts. The real right. problem is, is, is the appraisals are coming because I don't know about you, but, you know, we got our, our, our tax, taxes com come in, and I own a lot of different commercial real estate and residential real estate and whatnot, but they went up 10%. Yeah. Just ten percent. I mean, that, it just everything just capped out, and it's like, well, the, the rent that I charge didn't go up. Um, you know, nothing's changed. There's nothing significant that's just changed. And I think that you see, you saw this happening uh, across the state, and and before these these bills went in, and and these these significant increases that are going in, especially on commercial properties, and so we have to be very careful as to what we want our communities to look like, what we want our cities to look like, and what do we want people to continue developing here and spending money here. I spend my life in the commercial real estate business, and, you know, we'll invest money into cities and to states that are property tax friendly. And, and, and so I think that that's one of the things the legislature tried to accomplish. Was it yeah. perfect? No, I'm not saying it's perfect. Um, but had we done nothing, and I, and I would agree with, with Representative Davis, is that Five billion dollars in the scheme of things is a drop in the bucket when you're spending seventy billion dollars on public education. You want to get real meaningful reform, right? You need fifteen, twenty billion dollars, uh, and you got to come up with another mechanism to pay for it. I yeah. mean, that's the way you're going to get real tax relief. Re Representative Davis, again, wearing your appropriations hat, that is where I want to take this next. So we know what you've accomplished, and it was a start. It's not everything that you wanted to do. There are probably aspects of the school finance reform piece that couldn't accomplish this time. We're not done. We're just getting started. We're going to do more. 
Same on the property tax stuff. You found the money this session to pay for this. Can you guarantee us that you're going to be able to find the money in future sessions? One concern that I have, is that right? <laughs> so everybody wants to record this as, a, as one, an appropriator. One, <laughs> one, concern, one concern that I have is that you committed to this for the next two years and peace and blessings on you for doing that. But if you come back next session and there's a recession or other priorities show up in front of you that you need to divert to, how are you going to continue to, to invest that much money or potentially more? I know. I think you're right. Um, you know, we, we, we can't guarantee um, that we're going to have this money uh, in the next biennium. And the Constitution prohibits us from appropriating longer than two years out. So, right. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, Texas. Um, and so, yeah, well, there is a, there is a, no, I wouldn't say gamble, but we, we are, we have to hope that we are going to have a good um, right. you, Well, you, you know economy. what you've done here. You've set everybody's expectations at a certain level, and they're figuring that this is not only appropriation for these two years. Whether you said it or not or voted on it or not, they're assuming it's an appropriation for all time. Right, and, I, and, and we know that that's, that that's not the case. Um, we know when we came in, I know, let's see, Dan, Dan and I were, we came in as freshmen in 2011. We were in the largest recession in the, since the Great Depression, $20 billion budget deficit in the state. Right. We had to make significant cuts, all parts of the budget, including public education. Right. So, you know, we are only, we can only appropriate, we can only spend what we have, um, but... I think that the Texas economy, you know, it looks looks good. I mean, we had an, an updated BRE before we even left session with another half a billion dollars that right. um, we had an opportunity to spend. The rainy day fund um, has been growing significantly in this session. We were actually allowed to use it, which was a pretty significant change. That's a big change. Um, right. You saw a willingness to actually use the rainy day fund for, you know, current appropriations. Um, so, so you ex accept the fact that it's not a guarantee, but you feel as optimistic as you can under the circumstances? Yes. Yes. Um, Representative Wally, um, Representative Davis referred to 2011 when there was this significant budget shortfall and public education took a more than $5 billion haircut right in the budget. That wasn't a haircut. That was... Yeah. That was a decapitation. Yeah, that was... Right. Yeah. They cut the whole head off, not just the hair. Here's the thing about that. What I remember people saying at the time was, if you have a significant shortfall in the Texas budget, there are only certain places you can go to cut. And public education is the largest target because it's the largest appropriation. So what's to say that if you have a recession next time, the same thing won't happen again? You only have to, a couple of places to go, right? Well, I mean, that, I think that's the fear is the sustainability going into next session to right. continue the funding. Well, that, that's not the only area that we're, we potentially would cut. 2011 was, was a perfect example, cutting $5 billion. We got some of it back previous sessions, $3.5 billion, but that was only because we had a group of like-minded individuals in the House that stuck together. Right. A lot of urban Democrats, rural Republicans, and, and a lot of suburban Republicans that um, – came together and said, look, we got to restore some of these cuts. Yep. Um, and, and, and that was a good thing. Um, moving forward, public education is not the only area that we cut. It was, it was Medicaid. Uh, we, we, we do that actually currently when we pass, let alone H, our, our, our House Appropriations Bill, but also a supplemental bill because we shortchanged Medicaid uh, to the tune of about $2 billion. We, we, pay, we backfill uh, that in a in a subsequent uh, supplemental bill so that we pay last session's budget. Right, but if you don't have extra money lying around, it's harder to backfill that money. Is it not in a supplemental? It, it is, but you have the rainy day fund, and there, there hasn't been a will to, to use a rainy day fund. We use it unprecedentedly this session for Harvey Relief, uh, for a lot of things, uh, for again, for that $2 billion Medicaid shortfall. Yeah. Uh, we use, the, the when there's a will, there's a way to tap the rainy day fund. I right. think that was... Case in point was Hurricane Harvey relief, and all of us up four here right. uh, were champions, and particularly uh, uh, Chairwoman Davis and I sitting on a conference committee to make sure our Harvey money stuck in there. Right. Uh, and so when there's a will, there's a way to make sure yeah. that we fund the priorities of the legislature. But the, Senator Alvarado, the, the Medicaid example is a great one. You know, this is a case where a lot of work was done on public education that should be celebrated. A lot of work was done on property taxes that should be celebrated. But the amount of money we spend on health care in this state is enormous. 
and we didn't do an enormous About 85 billion 85 yeah. billion and we didn't do an enormous amount on this massive part of the budget this session and you're right we still fall at the bottom nationally we still have one in four people in our state that are uninsured and we continue well most of us do not but there are some that continue to ignore the topic and yes the focus was on education so we need to make sure that next session that health care is front and center number one there is no reason why that's music to my yeah. ears senator yes. yeah. and representative davis has the, the medical center i mean so many people come from all over right. the world to have access to the greatest health care and yet this is not a priority for the Texas legislative legislature. And I will tell you that when you talk about where are we gonna cut, within the Senate, I was part of a small ad hoc group that was looking for new revenue streams because you're right, we're gonna have to go back and figure out how do we sustain what we're doing, what we passed in HB3 and SB2. And we had quite a few things on the block. I mean, yeah. I know that there were people that wanted the to increase the sales tax. I and, and many others were not supportive of that, and that was kind of in a bipartisan effort. There were a lot of people who didn't want to take on increasing the sales tax. Yeah, but the, but the increase in the sales tax, Senator Alvarado, let's be honest, that's going to come back up in the interim as a topic of conversation and may very well come back up next session, right? It probably will, but I won't support it. It's a regressive tax, and I think there are other things that we can look to that um, – that might be able to supplement what we're going to continue to try to do with funding uh, some of the signature bills that we pass. I mean, yeah. we, lo we looked at everything, increasing whether it was the cigarettes tax, alcohol tax, look at readjusting the, the severance tax, which is pretty healthy right now. And for once, the rainy day finally lived up to its name. We spent several billion dollars that will come back home here to the Houston area for flood mitigation and help to rebuild our city. Yeah. Re Representative Davis, Senator Alvarado is right. You represent the medical center. You've been the appropriations uh, committee, subcommittee chair on health and human. This is something that you know as well as anybody. Mm -hmm. Our uninsured rate in Texas has gone back up. Right now we're adding more uninsured children to the state's roles year over year than we're adding children to the public schools of Texas. We're number one in the country in uninsured children, along with a lot of other superlatives that we wouldn't want for ourselves, right? So what's, what is the answer here? What does the state need to do, did not do this session, could do next session to get on this issue? Well, I think first, and Senator Alvarado said it perfectly, we have to prioritize. We need a health care session. This session, we prioritized public education. But I'd love to have a health care session next session. I'd love for that to be our focus. Our 1115 waiver is going to be expiring soon. We have negotiations with CMS that have to take place. Right. We stand to lose billions of dollars. Our hospitals do. Um, the district projects are going away. That's millions of people that lose health care. Half of that health care from those projects are mental health. I mean, so we're really getting close to, you think we're on the edge of the cliff, but if we don't, if we don't figure out this 1115 waiver issue, we are in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, but I would love to have a health a care session. I would love, I tried my best to get Medicaid uh, benefits extended uh, for postpartum for mom from, from 60 days to a full year. Um, the House actually passed that measure. We just couldn't get it uh, through the Senate. Yeah. Um, but we have to have a discussion about Medicaid expansion. I mean, especially since we're on the point with the 1115 waiver, expiration, it's the perfect time. Senator, I mean, pardon me, Representative Davis, you can do count. Do not insult not, me. Not yet. <laughs> do, not, do not insult you. I'd have her in the Senate any day. Well, well, well. Um, you, can't have her. You, you, can, you can count votes. There are not the votes for Medicaid expansion in this legislature. No, no. There are not the votes for Medicaid expansion as it has been labeled and described. But um, I think that there are other, there are ideas out there um, in terms of maybe different, maybe providing primary care or preventative care as opposed to some yep. full entitlement benefit package um, to, to, to have those conversations with the feds right. um, and then to be able to talk, you know, to our constituents because we do have the worst health care numbers, um, you know, in the country and, 
you know, we couldn't even get a bill that allowed you know kids to stay in chip not having to redo their paperwork every you know three yeah. months yeah. Uh, and we have kids yeah. rolling off chip just because of the paperwork issue. representative Hubert, do you like the fact that in the property tax bill voters were brought into the conversation right yes so if the if the government was going to act at a certain point they needed to go to the voters so the voter activation in these kinds of conversations is a positive yes to you in a bunch of other conservative states in the last election cycle where Medicaid expansion was a bit of a hot potato politically and where conservative state leaders said not only no, hell no to mm -hmm. Medicaid expansion, the voters of those states got Medicaid expansion on the ballot. Sure. And what do you know? The voters said, we want you to expand sure. Medicaid. Yeah. We're talking about very conservative states, states as yeah. conservative as Texas. Yeah. If it's okay for voters to be brought into the conversation on property taxes, shouldn't we ask the voters if they want to expand Medicaid? Yeah. I, look, I, uh, uh, you know, it, it, and some of you are going to boo me on this, but I was the guy that also carried the bill on uh, the sales tax swap. And people are like, oh, it's a horrible idea. And I, I know Representative or Senator Alvarado said that and where, where it's at. The whole premise that I had was let the voters decide. Let them decide yeah. how they want to tax themselves. Uh, let them decide how they want to pay for their. If we're not willing to do that ourselves as legislators, meaning we're not willing to take that tough vote, um, then we. And, and by the way, you know, we proved that we were able to do that with education uh, right. this time around. But if we're not willing to do that, then we have to give the voters the right to be able to do that, to be able to try to be, help them govern themselves. You know, look, I think if you put gambling on the ballot, I think that would pass. Yeah. Um, you know, I think if you right. did uh, med, med, the expansion of medical marijuana, I think that would pass. I think right. the, the, the dynamics are changing uh, in, in this country uh, to the degree that people are smart enough to be able to educate themselves to be able to do that. And look, you know, when we talk about health care, this is very interesting, though, because, you know, while I'm not uh, certainly an expert uh, in, in that field, I, you know, I look at Chairwoman Davis and Representative Wally as appropriators. The, the work that you've done has been amazing on that on that front. But. I can tell you in dealing with TRS and ERS and, and the TRS active care and the retired care, the biggest problem is the prescription drugs. That is the biggest cost that we're seeing the cost increase by. And I'll tell you, on TRS's yeah. side, it went up $700 million year over year. And, and so you have to ask yourself this question is that, you know, we, if we continue to just, you know, we've got to do... A, find a better way to deal with this. But think about it. Go home tonight, watch TV. I promise you, within, within a two-hour period, if you're watching TV, count how many prescription drugs commercials you will see on the television. Right. Think about that. Yeah. And then think about the costs associated with it. That is the problem that we're experiencing today in dealing with our health care problem. And we saw this with TRS. And all we're doing is continuing to throw money at the problem and not solve the problem. And so it's got to be a more balanced approach, whether it's a, a compact through a variety of different states that are out there. Uh, we talked about that uh, a couple sessions ago, uh, but we haven't made any action. So I would like to see, you know, while we haven't solved the problem in education, we've made a, you know, I, I think we've done a monumental step forward in 30 years. I think, you know, Representative Davis and, 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 and the others that are that are going to be dealing with this particular issue next session, it's got to be the, the most important thing that we deal with next legislative session. Uh, Representative Wall, you called out the diversity of Houston, and you said that your district was property poor. It's a very diverse district that you represent as well. That's correct. In many of the most diverse parts of the state, the problem of uh, not having access to health care or health insurance is more pronounced, right? As the population of the, of the state gets more diverse, as the composition of the population changes over time, this is a problem that's not only not going to go away, it's only going to get worse, right? Well, it, w it will get worse exponentially when you have um, areas of town that are um, uh, not exposed to the proper health care that we need, uh, particularly for communities like mine that, uh, for all intents and purposes, need uh, opportunities, the access of opportunities. And I think one of the issues, and it's tied to public education, is, is the disparity of, uh, in, in income the disparity in uh, the haves and the have-nots in our communities where there are certain segments of the, of the population in, in America, and particularly in Texas, that, that uh, are, are very, very um, prosperous and others that are not. And, and, um, and, and that's what, and, and 
trying to bridge that income divide between two communities, which, which mine is a very uh, diverse community. It's, it's probably 90% uh, black and brown district. Uh, and so the needs that, that, that I have in my, in my area are, are, might be different in other parts of the city. And right. so I think healthcare is a big component. This is of not that. West University Place. Well, I, yeah. I, yes, but I, I, again, I don't want to feed this, this animal of division. Yeah. I'd rather, I, I, I'm here, I, I work with uh, Chairwoman Davis on a daily basis on a lot of issues. So yeah. I don't want to put it in those terms. Uh, but I do want to say that the reality is, is we do have those facts. We do have people in here that are hurting uh, 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 education-wise, healthcare-wise. Right. And so for us, we have to get a handle uh, of our yeah. insurance costs. One of the things, I'm not a fan of, of doing things by referendum like California does because they do it all the time. But I think we're onto something if we allow the voters to say, hey, we need to expand Medicaid. Uh, I think that's a step in the right direction, uh, particularly when you have folks in yeah. Harris County that, the have, that have the highest insurance uh, uh, uninsured rate in the whole country. Right, largest, largest uh, uh, rate of any it, of the big counties. And, and one of the things that we did in the appropriations yeah. process is, is try to get money for community health centers. So like, for instance, UT Physicians opened up a U Clinic on uh, Jensen and Cross Timbers. Uh, that's 77016, 77093. Uh, those two zip codes have the largest disparity of folks that don't have insu health insurance. So UT Physicians opened up a 17 with the help of Health and Human Services Commission. We, we freed up $17 million through HHSC to open a new clinic yep. uh, in that area. I mean, that was historic that's for our community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Chair Huberty. I, I just want to add something real quick because I was just thinking about it, which is that, you know, when you, when you really think about it, people say, well, there's a lot of uninsured people and people just don't have health insurance. Well, the reality is, is that, you know, and you may shake your head no or yes, but everybody has health insurance. The difference is, is that what's happening is they're going to the emergency room. And, and so, you, you know, you're, you're having people show up when they're really, really sick and you're paying a lot of money for them to be treated at these emergency rooms and they don't have the ability to pay for it. Right. And so ultimately what happens is causing the cost of other insurance to go up and everybody else is that's paying for it. And we sit there and say, why, are, why is our costs going up so much? It's because you have to have this offset that's dealt with that. So we right. should be thinking about preventative maintenance. We should be thinking about better health and wellness and taking care of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, single moms that need the help to be able to deal with that stuff. Because if we put the prevent, it's like dealing with pre-K. You know, if we put the money in early, we right. teach the kid how to read, and we teach him how to read by third grade, guess what? We're going to spend a whole bunch of money in, in, in 12th grade well, it's, to remediate. Well, it's pay me now or pay me later. Well, is every, every how session this. you see the creation of new hospital districts right. um, in various parts of the state. Like we have, you know, Harris Health. But that is a community coming together to say we need to provide health care right. to those that are not able to afford it. And they... They become a taxing jurisdiction, and we, we pay a tax. It's on our property tax bill. But those are communities that are coming together that says that have said we need to get we need to pay for we need to provide health care for our right. community. And you see you see them created different ones every single um, right. session. So to me, that is kind of evidence that people are saying we need to we need to have a safety net for right. health care. Um, I'm gonna move the conversation along here because I want to bring people in the room into it and I would encourage you to go ahead and line up at the mics if you have questions for these folks. We have an election coming up in 2020. We just talked about how elections had consequences in 2018. We had extraordinary levels of voter turnout in this last election just compared to regular midterm elections, even compared to presidential elections and especially in Texas which has been at the bottom of voter turnout for years and years. We were 41st in the country in 2018. That was the good news, is that we were all the way up to 41st. We could see extraordinary turnout in the next election. Representative Wally, you are running again for re-election? I am. Chair Huberty, there was a question last time about whether you would come back. Are you going to take a victory lap after HB3 and not come back, or are you running for re-election? I, I'm getting on a plane to Toronto uh, tonight, so uh, uh, I'm taking some time to think about what I want to do. So. But you're not giving us an, a, a, a yes or no answer. Uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be really cold in Toronto. I understand. So uh, <laughs> you know we'll see we'll see what happens. Uh, when I think I we may there. have inadvertently lurched into news here. Um, <laughs> Representative Deflection. Davis, you know that you're going to have a, a a hot one back home in your district. You're running again. Yes, I am. 
Right. Senator, because you got elected in a special, do you not have to be on the ballot again this time? Yes, in 2020. And you are running again for sure? Yes. Right. Do you all believe that there is the potential for the next set of elections to have the same impact on the 21 session the way that the 18 elections did, Senator Alvarado? Absolutely. Yep. We're going to have a couple of different things going on. We have uh, no more straight ticket voting. And so that's going to be an education process that both parties will have Who to Who knew engage. the Democrats would mourn the loss of straight ticket voting huh? <laughs> after the last one? Yeah. Right. And then I think the, the driving issue uh, for us on the Democrat side, I think Representative Wally would agree, is going to be redistricting. Redistricting is going, the elections are going to have consequences which will lead into who's driving the seat, who's got the pin to draw these districts that are truly representative of the population of Texas. Um, let me just quickly ask, and then we will go to the audience, a show of hands for the three House members, Wally Huberty Davis. Which of you thinks, hand up if the answer is yes, which of you thinks that control of the House next time is legitimately in play? Two out of three? You don't think so. You do think so. Do you think it's possible, Chairman Huberty, that the Democrats could take back control of the House? Well, I, I, we were just we were trying to get the numbers right. Uh, nine gets you even, uh, meaning but, 70. Yeah, you know, but you got to hold all the seats you won last time, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and so, you know, and, and uh, you know, I happen to be very involved in our caucus and was involved in our PAC and everything else, and, and uh, we got wiped out. I mean, it was, and, and candidly, in some of those races, didn't even see it, you know, didn't see it coming. Come. Some we knew, some we knew we were going to get you know, whacked. We knew that, but um, but you know, Dallas is 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 certainly in play. Those seat Morgan Meyer, Angie Chin Button. Um, you know, those are. I mean, if you look at those numbers, I mean, you know, in, in Morgan Meyer's case, up in uh, up in uh, Highland Park, uh, I think Trump got forty one percent or forty two percent or something like that. Uh, Dwayne Bohack here. I think Dwayne I think won. The by, only place he did worse was my house. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> right. uh, Dwayne Bohack won by what? You know, fewer than a hundred votes. Yeah, a hundred votes. I mean, uh, you know, the seats we lost, Elkin seat, we lost uh, Schofield seat here. Um, you know, I think the surrounding suburban areas, my seat, obviously, you know. I live up in redneck country, so nobody, you know, I'll be fine. But, uh, you know, uh, the <laughs> your, your, your chief of staff just threw up in her hand, I think. Yeah. I know. Well, I do, Casey. It's Huffman and Humble and whatnot, you know. So, but I think that. Uh, my uh, brother and my sister live in your district. Yeah, yeah, they're not rednecks. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but but I think I think that. There, there is a there is a very good opportunity if 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 the candidates can get their messaging out, that'll be important. Now, the one big difference will be, and I think this is important, is that no longer, uh, you know, the straight ticket voting. Right. Right. So I think that's going to make a difference if you're able to educate your voters and and knock on doors and do the right. stuff you're supposed to do. Well, Representative Wally, the other big difference is going to be we have a presidential election. Well, at the time, I mean, when when we won these seats, uh, particularly if you're talking about just partisan partisanship wise. Trump was not on the ballot. Trump's on the ballot this time. Okay, okay but you now can't, he's on the ballot. Yeah, but who is your ticket? I mean, you guys could nominate it's, it's Michael Avenatti and Jesse Smollett as your ticket and completely <laughs> blow this, couldn't you? I mean, that's isn't that well, right? I I don't think we're gonna have that happen. Um, oh. Look, you 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 your initial question was, yeah. is the house in play? Yeah. I raised my hand because I think I think the house is in play. Right. Uh, the only thing, the caveat is. Uh, I still I, I still think it's an uphill battle to get to nine, right. but I think it's it wouldn't be unreasonable to say hey Democrats took the control of right. the legislature for the next. Right. Uh, you're, you all, but that's an assumption too that you're going to keep the 12 seats. Well, you have I to hold I mean, the ones you won. That's for sure. But Representative Davis, the conventional wisdom is for the Democrats to win back the House. Control of the House runs through your district. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll be fine. Okay. All right. Let's bring the audience up and please at you come on up to the microphones either side. We'll take as many questions as time permits and then we'll get you out of here at one o'clock. Ma'am, thank you for sprinting up to the microphone. <laughs> so there's a lot of great talks about um, the accomplishments that, accomplish, accomplishments that yep. you guys made on education, um, healthcare, but, and it kind of seemed like it was a kumbaya this session, um, but in the budget, something that kind of got overlooked is that there's this ideological program called the Alternatives to Abortion Program that received 60 million of taxpayer dollars. Alternative? Alternatives to Abortion. We call it the A2A strategy. A2A, yes. Okay. 
its only purpose has no oversight, no accountability, is to dissuade people from seeking abortion. Would anybody here on this stage dismantle this program, and what would you redirect that money to? Representative so Davis, you go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, yeah, so that's... It's a legitimate question. It's a strategy in Article 2, which I'm the subcommittee chair of. And you're right, uh, there is no real oversight. Um, and the money goes to essentially the, what are, I believe are crisis pregnancy centers, which just counsel religious kind of oriented uh, agencies that counsel women against abortion. Personally, I would not like to see a single tax dollar uh, go to the A2A strategy. But I cannot, my job as the chair of Article 2 is to prevent and to present an Article 2 budget to my chairman, Dr. Zerwas, that, that we can sell to the House, that the House will vote for. And uh, Republicans control the House. That is a strategy that is of the utmost importance uh, to Republicans. And so if I'm going to be able to increase funding for the women's health program for by 25%, I've got to make my Republican colleagues happy with the A2A strategy. Is there another Republican in the House other than you, Representative Davis, who would get rid of that program? I don't know, but I've never had, I haven't asked all, you know, Republicans, but it's generally from a conservative perspective, that's a, a priority in Article 2. Go here and then we'll go there. Sir. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate you all on a fine job with the education bill. One of the concerns I have, though, year after year, the Chronicle published an article ranking the schools A, B, C, D, F. Yes. And the last ranking came out in the Chronicle about two weeks ago. The same schools with Fs show up every year, year after year after year after year after year, and every school district have schools that are showing up year after year after year. I'm going to ask our Dan, will we see those same schools showing up on the list after the work that you've done this session? Right. Can you, can you affect that from an accountability a standpoint? A and absolutely. And, and the way that we did it, um, if you think about you know, the work that we did during the School Finance Commission, a lot of the work was done based upon what Dallas ISD had done. Um, in a four-year period of time, they went from 44 failing schools to four. And the way that they did that is we said, take your best teachers wherever they're at, pay them more, incentivize them, put them in the toughest places, and let that principal pick their team to be successful. But you got to pay them. You got to pay them to get there. You got to put the best possible teachers there. And that's the problem that we've had. And we've got that consistent problem in Houston. We've seen it time and time and time over again, which is that it's difficult to get those teachers to go into those tough school districts. But the way you do it is it's through incentives, it's through pay, it's through better quality of working conditions. Um, and so that's the way that we did it. We created the incentive pay program specifically for that reason. We created the ACE program. There's so many different programs that have been created now. There is no reason for those kids to fail. And it infuriates me, infuriates me that we have these kids in, of color mostly that are in these schools that are unable to read at third grade or fifth grade or seventh grade. We are failing those children as adults. And so we set this system up so that we don't do that. And by the way, if these schools don't do it and these superintendents and these boards are afraid to make those decisions, then by God, the state of Texas has come in and we're going to take care of it and we'll, deal, we'll do it for you. So you don't want us to do that, but that's what we're willing to do. Okay. Sir. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question was, what is considered low income for children who may qualify for pre-K all day? Um, the reason why I ask this question is because you may have a, a teacher who is a single teacher who is considered middle class but has two children and is still struggling. Right. Uh, Representative Wally, what, what, what triggers the pre-K threshold? Well, I, I think what, what happens is, and this is a, a, a general question because we get this question from other families that, that come in asking, you know, I, I try to apply, get my kid into a pre-K program at Aldine or HISD. We don't qualify because because of the income requirements. I think what we what we did in HB three is that it across the board um, incentivizes the the uh, readiness the reading readiness. I think it's it's called uh, to be able to uh, make sure that all those all those families that that for other for whatever reason be it income wise um, wouldn't qualify because they're in that I would say that gap where 
They make too much money. It's kind of like Medicaid. You make too much money yeah. to qualify for Medicaid, uh, but you make too little to get private health insurance, right? I, I would equate it to that, but, but I think what we did in HB3 is to do across the board um, uh, enhancement for yep. ISDs to be able to have families like yours or families like anybody else that wants to get into a pre-K program that they, that income, their income not be the, the deterrent. So I would say that um, in the future, with the passage of HB3, that, that we're gonna solve some of these problems where some of these folks, these, what I would, as you say, middle, for some folks, middle income uh, would be, um, a, for a family of four, probably thirty thirty five thousand dollars a year I, on a two two income uh, uh, ha family household that 's really not a lot of money uh, and so I think in the future uh, which these with the passage of these bills we 're going to we 're going to be able to help those type of families that that uh, wouldn 't get that help uh, yeah. particularly those children that um, that need that help sir as a mayor of a small town, I have a problem with your cap. If I don't have or take advantage of the cap, what kind of credit can I get if in the future I need to go and exceed the cap due to some exogenous extreme event like a right. Harvey event? Do you follow what I'm asking? Yeah, he's, he's saying uh, the property tax cap, if, if you have some event, one-time event occur and you need to exceed the cap, or will you be forgiven? Is there any wiggle room or flexibility within this to... Yeah, there's by there's, future credit. There's not, and that's why, uh, well, myself, that's why I voted against it because, for example, if there's another um, you know, natural disaster and the city has to increase, there has to be, have time, there has to be time for an election. And again, you're seeing here in Houston the consequences of that cap. And it's a, it's a combination of the inflation and population growth or 4.5%, whichever is lower. And now we're going to 3.5. Yeah. I think it's bad for local governments, and I, I don't think it gives. The only part of it that I thought was good was the transparency that Representative Davis talked about. You will go online and look at how the new rate is going to affect your property, and it gives you information on hearings when the, uh, the tax rate will be set. That was the only good piece of SB2 I Ch liked. Chairman Huberty, there was a point in the discussion over, over the tax bill where there was the equivalent of rollover minutes There's, on your it, cell phone, that's right? right? Where it's, if you don't exists. go all the way up, that you take the difference and you're able to apply that the following. You can bank it, right. It, yeah, there's it, a bank in there. So, and so, so that still exists. Still exists, yeah. So, so that's you, a little bit of flexibility. So you, can, so you can bank it so that if you've got a surplus for in one particular deal. And then just a clarification on the disaster piece of that is that there's, di there's disaster pieces in there as well. So if you have a disaster, you're able, you're able to deal with that. I think, Mayor, the most important thing is, is that, you know, from my perspective as a, as a Republican, you know, and it, it, it's certainly not the small town mayors or where we're having this problem, but we're having this across the state on the, I go back to the appraisals. You know, if the appraisal districts wouldn't come out and hit everybody at 10% and automatically you're just getting whatever that number is every year, you know, it's it, it becomes a problem, and so there's got to be some break that's put on this to, to be able to deal with that because we've got we're getting it from the other side as well from the homeowners and the business owners. I mean, I've got I've got you know friends of mine that own small businesses that are getting taxed out of their businesses because they just can't they can't afford them anymore. So we've got to have some mechanisms in place. Is this perfect? Probably not. Yeah. But, you know, we can always tweak it as we go forward. I think we've got to have some mechanism in place to be able to deal with this. So a couple of times you've called out and Representative Davis called out the appraisal problem here. If the issue was appraisals, why didn't you fix appraisals? Why do we have 254 different appraisal, uh, uh, county appraisal districts yeah. appraising property 254 different ways? Right. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with you at all on that. I was working on a small other bill. Uh, this session, so I'm you're, not you're really busy. sure. I get that. I, I had the bandwidth to deal with that. The, there's there's senators that deal with this and 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 whatnot that are out there that are probably more experienced in that uh, in in dealing with those particular. But you would agree, appraisal would, reform is potentially uh, absolutely. A next I think it has yes, to be. But also, I mean, I have these discussions in my house district, and we're talking about property tax. Nobody likes 
their appraisal the day that their property taxes do, but everybody loves to see their single greatest asset, which is most likely their home, go up in value. So when they sell year. their house, they love their appraisal. Right. right. So you have to be careful about market man manipulation. Um, so I think that there's, there's work that can be done on appraisals, but I think we have to be very careful about what we do. Um, and there's also, you know, there are members in the legislature who have a, you know, financial interest in making sure that they always have the opportunity to protest their appraisals. Really? Um, <laughs> Tell me how you really Do feel. Tell. Were you throwing shade at somebody who's <laughs> no, not in the no, room, possibly? No, that's just fact. Uh, Ma'am, this, this will be the last question. Okay, tagging on what the young woman referenced earlier. Um, thanks to those of you who have always been big supporters of reproductive justice, Yay. which includes preventing pregnancy. Um, a couple of you know where I work. Yes. Um, and I work at an abortion clinic counseling patients seeking abortion. And quite often they are delayed by those fake clinics um, that lie to them and give them misinformation about how far along they are. Um, and. Also, we, there, so I guess my question to you guys Thank you. is, uh, will you commit to fighting the constant, you know, attacks on the one organization in this state that prevents the most abortions over any, and that is Planned Parenthood? Um, and, and, and. I love a good non-controversial question here at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Representative Wally, uh, I think um, in general the the I think the attacks on women's ability to choose how they should control their bodies is between them, uh, their God, and their doctor. Um, I think that um, any attacks on any organization that tries to do preventative care, because if we're talking about Planned Parenthood, I, I'm assuming that's who we're talking about, is is that. Um, that's not the only thing that they do. Uh, they do a lot of preventative work, a lot of uh, uh, reproductive uh, health care that, that is vital to uh, young women and women in general, uh, particularly in my district, but across the state. So I think um, the, the A2 uh, alternatives to abortion, I, I've always been a, a <laughs> an opponent of that in the appropriations process. I've been very vocal uh, about that. Um, but I think that any effort to try to go down that route of a, yep. a, attacking a woman's ability to do what they choose uh, is, is between them. And, and I think we, as, and that's my personal opinion, shouldn't get yeah. involved in that. Senator, I said there were no sharp objects on the table this session, but the fact is there was legislation that affected SB 22. Planned Parenthood yes. that was, in the eyes of many people, a sharp object on the table. Yes, and that's one thing that you know, Sarah and I uh, worked on on a bipartisan way. And, you know, we have every session, I mean, this session we didn't have like a sonogram bill or anything like that, but you had a bill that prohibits local government entities from contracting for any reason with entities like Planned Parenthood, who in the past has worked with municipalities on Zika awareness, uh, on in other illnesses, HIV, and a very small percentage of the services at Planned Parenthood, I'm a former, proud former board member, very small percentage of the work that they do is abortion. To me, it's demeaning to continue every session to add another layer of bureaucracy and give women more hoops, more things to go through every session. It's, it's like they're saying, ma'am, little lady, you don't know what you're doing. Let, you have to go through more counseling and more scrutiny. I don't know of another medical procedure, any person, any other gender, any other segment of the population in Texas that has to jump through more hoops for a medical procedure than women do. It's very demeaning and it's wrong. And Chair Davis, you are with Senator Alvarado. So, yeah, so I've, I've been a supporter of Planned Parenthood. Right. I've been, I've been I, um, I accept and advertise their endorsements in my campaigns for re-election and obviously vote against Senate Bill 22 and in fact had the first amendment to strike the enacting clause and interestingly enough, I got I, I was invited I caucused with the Democrats that day. Oh, I noticed when that bill was on the floor. Oh, I noticed. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. But I also yeah. would like to just point out, though, that you know I'm a Republican and I'm pro-choice, and I, I have a Democrat co senator who's pro-choice, but it's not just partisan because there are Democrats that consider themselves pro-life and that consistently vote um, the opposite way. So it's you can't just right. pigeon pigeonhole Republican versus Democrat on the on this issue. Uh, Representative Huberty, I'm going to let you as the pro-life Republican on this panel. Let me let you have the last word, and then we're going to wrap. I'm a, I'm a pro-life Republican, and I'm not going to get into the debate on this. And You can disagree with me. Don't vote for me. Don't care. That's what I am. I've been my entire life. Unapologetic for it, um, and this is the way it is. But I focus on other issues. That is not one of the fights that I have uh, during the legislative session. So. All right. All right, we're going to end there. We're very lucky to have these four come out during the interim to be with us. Please say thank you to Senator Alvarado, Representatives Davis, Huberty, and Wally. Thank you, Houston First, and our sponsors. And, of course, thanks to all of you for coming. We appreciate it.